Uh, let me welcome members to the 12th meeting in 2015 in the Standards, uh, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee and, as usual, remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they can affect the broadcasting system. Uh, agenda item one is a declaration of interests. Um, before I get there, uh, we, we have a new member because, of course, Margaret McDougall, our uh, deputy convener, has uh, moved on to pastures new. Uh, let me express uh, our collective thanks for her contribution to the committee and uh, welcome, uh, welcome Mary Fee to this committee and invite you to declare any relevant interests. Thank you, convener. I have no relevant interest to declare, and further, I refer committee to my entry in the Members' Register of Interests. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. Uh, item two is the selection of a deputy convener. Parliament has agreed that only members of the Scottish Labour Party are eligible for nomination as Deputy Convener of Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. This being the case, can I invite nominations for the position of Deputy Convener? Mary Fee. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the nomination has been made. Uh, there is no need for a seconder. I take it you accept nomination. I do, continue. Uh, in that case, uh, I ask the committee to agree that Mary Fee be chosen as the Deputy Community of Standards, Procedures and Public Appointment Committee. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And I congratulate you on uh, joining us here. And I look forward to delegating a significant <laughs> amount of work to you in due course. <laughs> uh, agenda item three. Uh, next item of business is for the committee to agree to take agenda items 8, 9 and 10 in private. Agenda item 8 is the response to the committee from the Scottish Government on correspondence on the lobbying bill. Item 9 is for the committee to consider the evidence heard at this meeting on its inquiry into committee reform. And agenda item 10 is for the committee to consider a paper on consolidation bills. Do members agree to take these items in private? Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item four is for the committee to decide whether consideration of its evidence heard on its inquiry into committee reform should be taken in private uh, at this meeting and at future meetings. Do members agree to take this item in private today and in future? It would be helpful yes. if you said yes, thank you, or no, if that's your preference. Uh, right, agenda item five is for the committee to take evidence into its inquiry and committee uh, reform. Uh, we have unfortunately received apologies from Murdo Fraser and from Ian Gray. Uh, so let me welcome uh, two of our uh, uh, conveners, uh, Kenneth Gibson and Christina McKelvey. Uh, and let me simply invite questions from committee members. Who's going to kick off? Right, in that case, uh, l let me just kick off with, uh, since none of you indicated, uh, let me just kick off with a very open question, perhaps starting with Christina. Um, if, just to lay out, perhaps, if you think there are any particular things in relation to the operation of committees uh, that you would wish to draw to our attention for our consideration and perhaps proposals for change. Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Thank you for inviting me along to uh, your committee to take part in your inquiry. Also, um, there, there's obviously you know, a number of discussions we've had over the, the past few months about committees and how committees should function. I obviously chair the European and External Relations Committee, which meets on a Thursday morning, and that would probably be my first issue, would be the Thursday morning meeting and how it condensed you then have to make your committee meeting to meet um, the deadline for general questions. Um, I suppose for me, um, if committees, uh, in one of the threads that we've been discussing, if committees were able to meet while Parliament was sitting, then that would take some of the pressure off, off the workload. Um, the other issue is I have committee members who sit on other committees that sit on Thursday mornings. So uh, sometimes if we want to meet more often, um, uh, we tend to stick to a two-weekly programme, then you know, uh, facilitating that can be quite difficult. So having flexibility to meet in afternoons um, would be uh, very helpful indeed. Um, I think uh, you know, the general running of the committee, I have um, uh, three SNP members on my committee, uh, two Labour members and a 
Conservative member and we are about to cover a piece of work that, which I think would be extremely uh, interesting for our Liberal Democrat members and our Green members in the Parliament, you know, so that f for me, um, you know, ensuring that some of that information gets to other, you know, political parties who would have an interest in that, that inquiry work is very important. But then again, you know, getting them along to committee might be difficult if they're already sitting on committees that morning. So it's the same problem right through for the Thursday morning sitting. Um, so committee flexibility, I think, is, is, is one of the things that, that I would be keen on, um, you know, uh, scrutinising further. Um, and uh, how, you know, that can be resourced as well, because I understand the, the, the challenges that would pose. But for me, that's sort of my opening salvo. Uh, right. Before I go to Kenneth Gibson, let me just test uh, one of the things you said. Uh, which is sitting when Parliament is sitting in committee. And I wonder if uh, you have any views as to whether there are particular parts of plenary business that might be more suitable for overlap with committees. And without advocating this, I suggest that one might think about overlapping with members' debates, because, of course, there is no decision from par Parliament makes as a result of that, and perhaps, therefore, the implications might be less. I, I agree with you, and I think you know some of the the restraints that we have as parliamentarians is a stage three would obviously be a no go area. So stage three, if you've got amendments going on at stage three, then that's a no go area. Obviously, when there's a debate without um, a decision, uh, is, a, is another one. And possibly, if you're very very lucky, you've not got a member on your committee that morning who has a question for general questions. Um, but you know, in some cases, your committee could be stripped of maybe one or two or even three members who all have. Um, questions that morning and you have to be wrapped up in a way to, in order to allow them to, in some cases, get prepared for that and um, just get into the chamber in time. Uh, I take your point. I myself have a question this morning. Um, Patricia. I, I wanted to ask a, yes? a follow-up to fine. something Christina <coughs> said. I, I wondered whether, I, th I think we, we, we um, are very alive and our committee meets on a Thursday morning too, so we're very alive to the issue of the Thursday morning session. But I wonder whether an alternative solution would be to um, change the sitting pattern. Uh, we didn't used to sit in the mornings, uh, in, or every afternoon rather, in the way that we do now. And I wonder whether reverting to not necessarily the same sitting pattern as we had before, but just a different sitting pattern might help to resolve that particular issue that now a number of committees, unfortunately, have. Yeah, and, and you know, I've, this is my second term here, so I had a term where we didn't sit in the, the, uh, the Tuesday afternoon, and I had a committee on a Tuesday afternoon, which always seemed to be I was able to prepare for that much better than, than maybe other ones. Because generally, uh, the Europe Committee starts at 8.45, you know, so you're, 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 you're talking about early starts for people as if, you know, they were doing a bit of a pre-meet or whatever, you know, you're talking about that. But, no, I, I, I agree with you. The best formulation for that, I think there was lots of conversations the, the time that we were changed, you know, over to a Tuesday sitting in the afternoon as well. I think, you know, it's a difficult one to do. Uh, I see that maybe there's a proposal to try and maybe do committees on a Monday afternoon. That would be something I would be quite resistant about. Um, I spend all of my Mondays and Fridays, no doubt, like yourself, you know, um, covering constituency work usually, you know, from first thing in the morning to whatever, you know, community council or public uh, meeting is on in the evening as well. So that would that would be difficult if we had to uh, sit on a Monday <coughs> afternoon. Um, it, you know, better people than I am, I am would come up with a formulation of how we should sit. Um, but I do think that you know the additional, the change to the sitting pattern has put pressure on committees, especially on Thursday mornings. Mary Fee. Thank you, convener. Um, Patricia has asked part of my question because it was around the, the, the sitting pattern in, um, in Parliament and the impact of the three afternoons, but you have answered that. The other question I, I was going to pose, um, when, when you talk about the pressure on committees and the timing of committees, and, and I too used to convene a committee on a Thursday morning, so I absolutely know the pressures that you're under. Um, Committees sitting at the same time as Parliament causes problems as well. It's, it's, it's what business is it OK not to be present for? I understand that. Having committee evening uh, meetings in the evenings, is that something you think would, would gather favour? There's um, a lot of events on in here at night that a lot of MSPs attend. Perhaps we should look at having committee meetings in the evenings. Um, well, we, we are, we're all on, and no, no doubt, you know, 
like myself, we're all overextended on cross-party groups that we sit on. Um, you know, I tend to think maybe there's too many cross-party groups, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, a bit, of, a bit of work on that is is needed. Um, I understand when people have got an issue that they want that to be the cross-party group. I understand that absolutely perfectly as well. But, you know, there's a lot of competing um, um, cross-party groups or events or, you know, receptions. Or for, for me, I generally, you know, host something every other week. Um, and a big part of that is due to being the committee convener because it will be, you know, a European event either in this place or in, you know, round the corner at the European Parliament office or up at the university. You know, so, you know, and, and a few times a month I'm doing um, a, events in the evening that are linked to being the committee convener as well. You know, so I'm maybe not the best person um, to, to say, well, I've got free time in the evening to be able to sit down and do a committee when I, I've got some of that other, just, just it's, and it's, it's just a normal process of being the convener of that specific committee um, that, that causes that pressure. But, you know, I, I was on a committee in, uh, in the first session who sat uh, once through, with PO's permission, uh, in the afternoon, and then we sat into the evening as well, and we came in during summer recess to finish a report. So um, that flexibility is is there, but you know it's it's difficult to make sure you can get everybody around the table. Okay. Now, I've got two further asks to contribute, but if if I may, I'm going to defer that because I really want to bring Ken, and I wasn't wanted to open it up without having heard from Kenneth. So, Kenneth. Well, I'd like to comment on some of the, the, the points. Uh, can, can I just say, the way we should do this, I'm perfectly happy for an interplay between the two yeah, conveners, uh, if yeah. that helps us understand. Well, first of all, my position is quite clear. I was one of only two MSPs who didn't vote for the Parliament to have plenary sessions on a Tuesday, because I actually think we need to spend more time engaging with constituents. So, therefore, I'm automatically against any meetings on Monday or Friday. And I would be happy for the Parliament to go back to, what, to the way it used to meet previously, because... I actually think a lot of the plenary sessions are unnecessary. There's a lot of filling goes on in between, uh, in between uh, uh, bills, and uh, uh, certainly I'm totally against committees meeting at the same time as Parliament because uh, I don't think that members should have to have the choice of even going to a members' debate, which may be of very specific interest to them, let alone uh, something of, of, of importance in the, in the chamber. So I'm against that. In terms of evening meetings, I'm afraid I'm against that too, simply because I think one of the Parliament's great strengths, and I went to two um, events last night, was its engagement with Civic Scotland. And I think a lot of people are saying to me how different it is uh, to engage uh, with um, MSPs and ministers here as opposed to MPs and ministers uh, at Westminster, for example. So I think that's something we don't want to damage, and I think evening meetings would certainly uh, uh, damage that. So I think it's a, it's, it's a real difficult one because, you know, w there's a lot we need to do and there's only limited amounts of time, but I certainly would prefer it, it the way it was before with Parliament meeting on a, a Wednesday and a Thursday um, a, a afternoon, and that would, I think, give us a wee bit more flexibility. Um, so that, that's my, my view on that, those particular uh, issues. Do you have anything else you want to say at this stage? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things you first talked about was, uh, I mean, it was about, well, where do we start? Got, there's a vast amount we can cover here. I mean, uh, first of all, I think when committees are, are organised, I think it, uh, there is a lot of responsibility on the convener to ensure that the committee runs effectively, and that means... Things like, for example, members are turning up one time, not wandering off in the middle of sessions. I don't allow electronic devices because I think it's a discourtesy to witnesses. Other communities have a different view. Uh, I, and I think what's important is all members get, get, get full reign to ask questions and that where possible decisions are made on a collegiate basis. In terms of what actually happens in our committee, I think that there is an issue that we have uh, which we would like to do, in that we do not, because we got all the, 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 the financial memorandum, etc., and they, they, they can often be like buses, you know, you don't get one for a couple of months and then they'll come at once, and timetabling is always an issue, and, and of course we're not always in command of our own timetable. For example, the, the um, uh, new four-year spending review won't come to November, so we're going to have a truncated budget process, unfortunately. So, But what that means, uh, the way the Finance Committee works now, is that uh, we don't have as much time, and we'll have less time in the future because we're discussing uh, not just how we spend money, but how we raise money to do things, for example, which we've found very useful in the past, such as our inquiry into demography or preventative spend uh, inquiry, both of which had, had strong cross-party input and support. And so that, so uh, w there is a, a concern that we're not able to flex our 
uh, muscles, so to speak. And, and uh, another thing we want to look at is post-legislative scrutiny. Um, you know, bills are passed, and what happens in finance is often, just as an example, is that um, the Scottish government will come along and say, this piece of legislation we think will cost... Uh, £10 million a year and we'll fund local government or whatever it is for £10 million. Cause will then come along and say, well, we think it's going to cost £40 million. Now, who's right and who's wrong? The only way we, we can see who's right and who's wrong in this Dutch auction is if we actually... We take evidence, obviously, but uh, an occasional we've sent, as you probably know, financial memorandums back when we've been happy with them. So, but we, uh, we really need to be able to have time to do post-legislative scrutiny so we can say, well, look, who is actually accurate here and why were they not accurate and what can we do differently uh, in the future? And, and that takes me on to something else, which is about... If we look at the departmental structure of government, it's changed quite markedly since 2007 and that ministers, at least in theory, are supposed to have a, a, a kind of cross a way of working and not just focus on their own specific uh, agendas. But I'm not convinced the scrutiny function in committees has necessarily changed to match that. And I think there has to be more scrutiny, not just of what we're going to do in terms of the year ahead, in terms of spending, but what happened in terms of the outcomes not just in terms of the, the area I've spoken about already, but uh, what, you know, was there value for money? Was that the correct way to spend money? Could we have got a better result spending it elsewhere? So I think there's a, there's a, a lot of that. So I think the difficulty is always time pressure, resource pressure, and prioritisation. And I think uh, in, in our committee, our concern is that we have less flexibility because of the new devolved powers than we've had before, and that does cause, cause concern. Can I, before I come to both uh, Cameron and David, who signal they want to come in, just on the issue of time in particular for financial memoranda that, mm -hmm. that your committee has to deal with, do you think Parliament has enough information available to it when it makes decisions about timetabling for bills? Because it's that timetabling that either creates or denies your committee perhaps adequate time to do what you're doing. Do you think we have enough information when we make these decisions? Yes, I mean, well, I think I think we do in actual fact because, for example, in the last year, a couple of times I've said, look, I'm sorry, we don't have time to scrutinise this effectively. You know, you're just going to have to delay delay the process until such times as we can actually look at this. And ministers have, have said, OK, fair enough, and they've been able to do that. Uh, what actually happens with financial memorandum is we obviously put out a call for evidence, and sometimes we'll get a lot of detailed evidence from a lot of different states stakeholders and we try and take evidence from people as, as other committees do across a range of views. Uh, sometimes, however, the, the responses are pretty anemic and I'll consult with other members on whether or not we should even take evidence because it may be just a complete waste of time eh, because the money involved is minimal, you know, sometimes only a few thousand pounds or, uh, or there is no one who's either desperately for or desperate against what's being proposed. Uh, whereas in other uh, bills, you know, we have very, we take very detailed evidence, and what we try and do is as much of a spread as possible uh, uh, on that particular uh, issue. Can I, can I come in just on a point? Um, obviously, uh, Kenneth has uh, picked up on the point of uh, financial me memorandums and the issues that that can cause within the committee. I've got an added dimension, and um, if we have an EU directive that is flagged up <coughs> as a subsidiarity issue, um, and one of the challenges is that uh, Westminster are waiting very, very late in the day. They have about an eight or nine week period to respond uh, to, to the EU on these matters. Um, and recently there was a directive, it was about free movement of workers, it had been delayed at Westminster, they then, dis they then thought there was a subsidiarity issue with it, came to the Scottish Government, it came to me later that evening, um, so we then had to call a quick committee to consider that, and there wasn't a subsidiarity issue. You know, but we then had to report back, ensure we were reporting back to the, to the, um, the, the committee at Westminster, and then obviously to the, to the European Commission. So you've got the added dimension in my committee that if something like that comes, you know, we need to have the flexibility to meet you know, in an ad hoc basis, we managed to get, I think, all but one member around the table to, in order to, to deal with that very, very important and pressing issue. Yeah, right, Mary Fee. Yeah, has a. I wanted to ask a, a specific um, question to um, Kenneth Gibson. One of the things that we discussed last week, very briefly, was the issue of subcommittees. Now you'll know that there's the, the policing subcommittee. Now, I, I have a number of, of concerns around how subcommittees would work, what the makeup of the subcommittees would be, and how how they would um, how they would be seen to be doing the correct scrutiny, and how they would be accountable to the committee. And, and while I don't want to um, 
give the impression that I rank any committee of more importance than the other, but given the specifics of your committee and the type of work and scrutiny that your committee on an ongoing basis does and will continue to do, and that will increase, I'm, I'm interested in your views and subcommittees and how they would work. Okay, uh, I, I am not uh, keen on subcommittees much because we've got only got seven members on the committee and I think that given the importance of budget scrutiny, I think we want to have as big an input as possible from as many members as possible. So therefore, I, I'm, I'm not really that keen. We, we have had uh, subcommittees when we've went out on various visits, you know, to look, for example, in our employability inquiry at different kind of areas and, and that was, uh, we sent groups of, of, of two members, always with more than one, one party, obviously, in the group of two. We're actually... Uh, going to uh, the Basque country uh, later this year um, to look at um, basically their fiscal framework relative to Spain. And what's holding up a date for that is that I want to ensure that the three members who will go will represent three different political parties and one of the other members is having difficulties with dates and we may have to change the dates. So I think that if we are going to have subcommittees, it should only be as a last resort. And if we do, there has to be um, um, you know, good cross-party involvement in that and I, 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 but I'm very resistant on the on it generally in, in terms of the, the wider committee um, remit simply because I think the budget process is something that everybody at all levels wants to have a, an input into and incidentally in terms of finance committee one of the things that we decided yesterday was we we're taking evidence on the Scottish rate of income tax now that's, we've never done that before because a new tax that's going to have four different evidence panels. So that's just a, that's four panels of evidence that we would never have had to take before. And obviously that squeezes our other business. I mean, because we have to take evidence from everyone from Civic Scotland to trade unions to business to indeed uh, informed members of the public. Um, so uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's all about squeezing a quarter into a pint pot and making things efficiently. I, ha efficient. I have to say, what the first thing I did, though, was uh, finance convener was move the committee from a Tuesday to a Wednesday because to ensure that uh, to maximise the turnout of members, because not all members can come on a Tuesday morning if they've got business in the constituency on a, on a Monday night. And I think having a, a committee on a Wednesday, which not everyone can have because there's not enough rooms apart from anything else, uh, it certainly is an advantage. Right. Now, let me play the two members who previously, and thank you for your forbearance. Uh, Cameron first. Thank you very much, Kavina. Um, we discussed last meeting, uh, last, last week, um, that maybe Tuesday afternoon should be a members' debate day. I rather agree that there are too many, I won't call them, um, uh, I've got to be careful here, debates that are not necessary, let's put it that way, repetitive debates on subjects that we don't really need to debate, just to fill in the time, time-filling debates. And I think, I wonder if we couldn't make Tuesday afternoon a members' debate debate day, just for members, with committees able to meet in parallel on that case. Also, there was a suggestion to me to make FMQs to 2pm on a Thursday, rather than this, so we do not constrained, as we are here this morning, to, to, to finish at 11.30. I wonder, I think that was a very sensible suggestion. And I think it's also more sensible to use the chamber time more effectively to focus on the stage threes, because that, I find that very baffling. So that was my Sort of. We'll have to say that in terms of your moving of FMQs, I think that's an excellent idea. I think a lot of uh, people who come to the Parliament come from far and wide, and it's difficult for them to get here uh, and get through the sausage machine at the front door early enough to to be able to get into questions, etc. Uh, I'm mean, certainly in my constituency, which isn't the furthest away, that's caused difficulties in the past. So I mean, I, th I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be a good idea because we have questions, uh, portfolio questions, on a Wednesday at two o'clock, and it seems to work quite well. Um, it's apparently it was moved yeah. to, to yes, the I, appreciate I, don't, that. Should, I don't think I we should worry about that. I, I, I'm of the same view as you. I don't think that's necessarily it, we should be. I'm, I'm also not convinced, I have to say, about topical questions. I'm not convinced that that's mm -hmm. been a particular uh, success, right. to be honest. And I'm not, I, I think if, if something was to be moved or even removed, then I think topical questions would be the first to go. I think general questions is, I would like to see that extended, you know, beyond 20 minutes to 30 minutes. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I'm sure we would all like to see FMQs extended as well um, to give more people in the back benches more time to come in. So uh, I think that's an excellent idea, certainly, having it later on a, in a, in a, in a Thursday. Can I, say, can I just say to colleagues that obviously we are looking at committees and, well, it, well they, they, no, it touches on, it touches on Thursday morning. Well, Thursday mornings. Yes, yes. You more flexibility. I'm, I'm not trying to shut down getting some things no. on the on the record and that. I'm just saying let's try and be careful to remember yes. 
But we're trying to... Well, if we just put it that it's... Sorry, if we just put it that it's actually to give more time for the committees on no, no. Thursday, that's the reason. No, no, Cameron, I was quite content with your contribution. I'm merely oh, just saying you. We're actually, that's... we've got a big enough subject without yeah. trying to reform okay. the whole of Parliament <laughs> in this particular inquiry. I, th I and, think, though, to, sorry, to be convenient, to be fair to, to Cameron, though, everything that's done impacts on the committees yeah. because, uh, because it impacts on the flexibility that committees have when they can meet uh, and for how long they can meet. And uh, certainly the, the suggestion that Cameron's made would free up a lot of time in, uh, on a Thursday. Well, and it's not my intention to shut down mm. coverage of more general issues. I'm, mm. I'm just... But let me bring Dave Thompson in. He's been waiting very patiently. No, I like him. Uh, very unlike him, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, just I thought I'd make an exception for today, convener, you know. Um, I agree uh, with a lot that, that Cameron has said and, um, <clears throat> you know, having sat on a Thursday morning committee for quite a lot of time and, and been a convener of one, I'm very sympathetic to the issues <clears throat> around that and, uh, you know, the, the moving of FMQs to after lunchtime would certainly free up a lot of time for uh, committees and if we think about where we're going with this, we're going to have to look at the the number of committees and the remits, especially with some additional powers coming to the Parliament, and it may well mean that uh, <coughs> some of those powers will be allocated to some of those committees who would need to meet on a Thursday morning. So, by definition, they're going to need more time. So, we need to create that time on a Thursday morning, and the only way you can really do that is to move FMQs. Uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't uh, agree with Kenneth Gibson on the topicals. I think they have been useful, not every week, I would, granted, but quite often there have been some really meaty subjects that have allowed a lot of MSPs to come in with supplementaries, and that was a major change because normally on portfolio questions and general questions you get one supplementary question. On topicals, the innovative thing is that a member can, can come back with at least two supplementaries and other folk can come in with supplementaries as well. So I think there's a, there's a value in that. What you could do um, is have... I mean, I'm not convinced about general questions, to be honest, on the Thursday. You could actually have a session on the Monday running from 2 o'clock, which would be topical slash general. So there could be preset general questions, but also space for topic. Sorry, Tuesday. did I say Monday? Oh, Tuesday. Yeah. I meant Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I saw the, the arrows flying from the eyes. <laughs> There's no patience for you at all. <laughs> None at all. Uh, <clears throat> On, on a Tuesday, so you could still have the ability to raise a very late topical question, but also have set general questions if you want them to continue. That would f You would then have questions on a Tuesday, portfolios on a Wednesday, and FMQs on a Thursday, and you could increase the time for each of these questioning sessions if you wished, and reduce the plenary time for debates um, <coughs> to, to maybe run from round about 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock with the proviso that any debate can run on into the evening anyway and we've done that on numerous occasions if it's necessary to run on till 6 or 7 or even uh, 8 o'clock. So I think by adjusting what we have just now we can actually achieve the creation of a lot more space for committees, a more sensible time for plenary debates, and personally, I think increasing the time for members to ask questions and to have more supplementary questions is a really good idea, because that is where members can really put ministers, the FMQ, uh, the, the First Minister, uh, under pressure. So I just think that kind of broad approach, I think, would be very, very useful. Uh, just a couple of observations. Uh, you number two, uh, Patricia. Um, don't let's forget those emergency questions, although the rules around that might be worth revisiting. Uh, and actually, it's already possible, and it has happened, that you get multiple supplementaries, because I've caught the, the presiding officer's eye and had a second supplementary. Uh, so it does happen, but it's very exceptional. Very, very exceptional. I mean, I think it was about 10 years ago that that, that happened. So, you know, that's the case. Um, right, uh, uh, Christina. Um, just as a, a, an add-on to my uh, uh, expression earlier of uh, committees meeting during the sitting time, um, we met recently via video conference with the Irish Parliament's European Committee, who uh, the committee sit during 
their parliamentary sitting time and they had to get up four or five times to go for a vote. You know, so, um, I suppose some of the legislation that was going through their parliament at the time you know, lent, lent itself to the, those interruptions, but that's maybe a pitfall if we are you know, thinking about that, if there is an emergency question or an emergency you know, vote or a statement or, or something like that. That's something to think about. I think the big elephant in the room is do we have enough members in this parliament to facilitate the committees? Um, and that's not something I'm going to take a position on because it's a, it's, it's, it's a tough one to, to agree. But when you, you think about 129 members, take out the presiding officer, take out the ministers, take out in some cases conveners and spokespeople, you're left with a very, very small number of people. Um, and in referring back to, to, to Kenneth's point about um, uh, subcommittees, you know, I would be worried about the cross-party element of that as well, um, whether there would be enough members <coughs> to facilitate that. Uh, and then again, you know, whether you know, that function would, would, would work. The other side of that is if you've got lots of subcommittees, you're going to need lots of clerks and lots of support in the background to, to facilitate that as well. And that's something I think we need to take into account. As far as um, Dave's ideas about, you know, questions, um, I would maybe agree that I, I'm, I'm not sure about topicals, but I like how it's done. I like the idea of uh, additional time to ask uh, questions. Um, I think maybe if some of those, you know, some questions were, were tailored a bit better or whatever, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm a person that rambles anyway, so I'm not the best person to um, you maybe give advice on that. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking at sitting times for, for each afternoon, how do we formulate them to work better so that committees have got more flexibility? Um, and that seems to be the, the main crux of what we want to try and establish here. Patricia? Yeah, um, I, I'm very conscious that we want to hear from our colleagues um, who are not on the committee. But I, I would just um, make two, uh, or a couple of, of, of very brief points, hopefully, and then ask a couple of questions, if I may. Um, one is that um, Dave was absolutely right to say that FMQs was changed because of the need to satisfy the timings of the press. And it, it was also because um, general questions came immediately before, so it meant it, it ran on even further. Um, and in a sense, FMQs actually gives a focus to general questions and makes general questions sometimes feel a bit more um, lively because you've got more people in the gallery, there's more of an atmosphere, there's more of a feel. Okay. And I don't think that's necessarily... I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd quite like to see that session extended. Mm -hmm. um, but if we are serious... And the reason we got portfolio questions, because in the beginning we didn't have those, mm -hmm. was because we wanted to be able to give a real focus on individual portfolios. Then I think those questions particularly, but probably general questions too, should be capable of having two or three supplementaries from the member asking the question and an additional question. And I personally would be quite happy to see us doing more. I, I'm not keen on topical questions. I don't think it's great. Um, but I, I would be keen to see us having more questioning of, of ministers in the government. Um, and I would have said that in times when we were in government too, um, than, than we currently do. And I think that's a good thing. But I think it's also about the balance because we're all very conscious that the public thinks we don't do very much at all. And if they think we're just asking questions and not actually debating meaty issues, then you could have a problem there too. But I think there is a balance to be had. I definitely do. And um, you know, I, I, I think the question sessions are actually pretty important. But uh, Kenneth Gibson was quite right, and we raised this last week too, to say that there are a lot of debates that feel like fillers um, that are really not necessary. And I think Cameron had some um, trenchant words to say about that too last week. Um, uh, uh, Dave's point about meeting into the evenings, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not keen on that. Um, I think there's enough goes on anyway. Um, we do try to be family friendly, and as we rehearsed last week, that can only ever work for those of us that live in the central belt. But I, almost every night, I'm going back to my constituency to a meeting or to something else, and if I can do that, I think that's a good thing. I don't want to be here 
into the evening um, sitting in, in plenary session. I don't think it's good and I don't think it's helpful and I think you lose your focus after a while in the chamber. So, I th you know, I, I just think stage three is a, the prime example. Um, does anyone actually know what we're doing in stage three? Only the people who've been directly concerned with the bill mm -hmm. one way and another. However, I, I did genuinely want to ask some questions of our colleagues and one of them had been the idea that perhaps there should be more members of the parliament. It's been raised with the committee um, but interestingly, nobody, and I include myself in this, wants to advocate it. Well, 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 but I do think it's maybe something... Sorry, Ken. Sorry, sorry. Oh, I, 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 I'm wanting to provoke your response, so I'm grateful. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I do think it is something that perhaps does need to be given um, some consideration. But the other interesting issue that was raised last week, and again, this is me playing devil's advocate, was the idea that we curtail the number of bills that can be taken in a parliamentary session. Uh, now, I don't know what you'd curtail that, can curtail that to. I know the average is round about 12, I think, every year. But maybe um, it, it needs to be looked at. But I think if you were to do that, and I'm slightly contradicting myself here, I think there would have to be a bit of a waiting because we do know that there are more bills necessarily go to justice, for example, than to other committees. So you might have to look at how that broke down. But I, I would genuinely be interested to hear colleagues' thoughts on, on those two things. Uh, well, on bills, of course, uh, the presiding officer has been somewhat exercised with reasonable cause that this session we've only one committee bill, and it's our bill on members' interests, which is a, you know, a very narrow uh, issue, uh, and, and, and perhaps there's an issue there. Um, the other thing that came out of what we said there, which I just put, put to colleagues, which isn't really a committee, but questions, given that the people who get to ask questions is by ballot. Does that not prevent, inhibit, make it difficult for those who are informed on, for example, justice to be those who are asking questions at justice question time? Because it's because the name's got to come out of the hat. Yeah, of course. Um, but you see, I think we all have an interest in justice, and I don't think you can say that only those who have that no. interest should be able to ask questions or even have the majority of questions. But I think what does happen is that um, if you are a party with more backbenchers than other parties, then your opportunity to be called is probably decreased. Uh, and I, I don't think the, ran, the random selection doesn't work. It should just in terms not of, mean that. Yes, but they're not weighted in any way. So no. I, it's just something else. I actually uh, went 15 months. Oh, I've done that too. Without getting my name ever coming out yeah. of my hat. And, and I have to say, one, one of the things I found it very difficult, I was spokesperson, and for 13 months I didn't get called to ask a question in the areas that I had responsibility for. And so you have to rely on someone else yeah having something that you could possibly piggyback on if you've got a burning issue you want to raise by via an oral question. And I don't know whether there needs to be some kind of mechanism for spokespersons questioning government or something. But that's that's I, I, I just thought I would throw that in a light of what was being said. But yeah. but but I think I think I Ken, did you want to come back first there? And well, I'll yeah, I mean, I mean, no, in terms of uh, the number of members, I seem to remember a young radical by the name of Dave Thompson getting pilloried in the press for <laughs> suggesting uh, an, an additional number of MSPs. I think he was the first one to put his head above the parapet and was uh, kind of uh, uh, metaphorically decapitated for it, actually. I, I, I mean... <laughs> I think it, I think really it's about how we do our jobs. I was I, I was thinking about um, uh, if you look at the state of Israel, which is a population of eight million uh, people, uh, they only have 120 members of the Knesset. They're all elected by a list system, and they don't have constituents. They just spend their time dealing with policy uh, and legislation. Uh, you know, regardless of what you think about that particular country and in and, uh, and, and, and terms of those policies, whatever. Uh, that's how it's structured now. We have a totally different system. And the issue we have is that, certainly for myself, even though I'm a convener of the Finance Committee and all that, uh, at least three quarters of my working week is dealing with constituency matters all day Saturday, all day Sunday, Monday, Friday, and during the day when I'm knowing debates, etc. Like because it's the third committee I've been to in a row, I've had to uh, defer from speaking in debates uh, um, the last two afternoons because I've just had so much constituency what to deal with. And that's a real issue that we have. And I think the more accessible you are, the more people are likely to come to you uh, th than others. Uh, so I think that that's an issue. I, I was, 
thought I was a list member in the first part and I always thought that the, the, the balance could be taken up by list members perhaps doing more on the committee side uh, than, than, than first past the post members but that's another issue in, te in terms of, of, of bills I'm not f in favour of curtailment simply because I think the people who would lose out would be individual members I mean we've seen that Anne McTaggart's got a bill on organ transplantation which I'm very supportive of and it's taken a, a, a while to get through the sausage machine and I worry that members will not be able to get bills through it takes uh, an earthly to get through as it is a ridiculous amount of time I think they could be expedited um, I think, uh, uh, so I think that's something we could but I certainly don't want to have any curtailment in terms of topical questions if we're talking about being a, the reason I mentioned topical questions is about freeing up time for committees which is what this discussion is about but I think you know uh, a lot of people will not submit a topical question because they're hoping to get an FMQ mm -hmm. and I think it'd be better to have 45 minutes of FMQs and maybe five or six um, backbenchers yeah. asking questions I mean last week you know the presiding officer said I'm going to take more questions for members and I had a really important constituency issue and I wasn't called and only two people get called Murdo on the back of one of the other three questions and the only constituency question or well, so, yourself sorry was, you, you were you were after, after that just at the end uh, Patricia you were the second, you were the third person the first person David Tonson he was only one in a constituency matter so clearly we're not getting enough time for constituency members and I know the presiding officer is always trying to get the front bench you know the, the party leaders to and, and the first minister to 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 hog it less, but that's not going to happen. What we need is an extension of time, and if we have to get rid of topicals to have an extra 15 minutes in FMQs, that would give us complete flexibility on a Tuesday for committees, and if we had them at 2 o'clock, it would give you the whole of Thursday morning as well. So um, I, I, I think that's the way forward, and have plenary sessions on a Wednesday and Thursday afternoon. Could yes. I just yeah. clarify something? Can I just, just say, just yeah. while it's a moment, the Australians have a seven-minute timeout on questions. Finished or not, guillotine comes down after seven minutes. Next question. Patricia. If I something, um, but I'll just throw in that the Irish interrogate their first minister every sitting day. Um, but what I was going to say was... No members in the chamber when they're doing it. When they're doing it, it absolutely. Um, but what I was going to say was I wasn't suggesting curtailing members' bills. Actually, I would like to give more resource to members' bills. I'm talking about curtailing government <laughs> bills. Um, you know, with the provision that if there's something no. of an emergency nature... That sure. Right. Uh, Let's I've not forget there's a member's business debate at lunchtime on a Thursday as well. Indeed. Yeah. Oh, no, in, yeah. Indeed. 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 Um, I think I've got uh, David next. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, don't forget that before we moved to Tuesday afternoon plenary sessions, we met on a Thursday morning plenary session. So you can't just do away with Tuesday afternoon and keep your Thursday morning for committees. You'd have to fit in the plenaries either on Wednesday morning or Thursday morning. I actually think having the opportunity to do plenaries with ministerial statements earlier in the week on a Tuesday and having big debates on a Tuesday is a really, really valuable thing and I would be really, um, I really don't want to lose that. I think we can adjust the current system to uh, give us more time for committees. I like the idea of having the Tuesday afternoon plenaries available for ministerial statements, but also to have the three members debates that afternoon. These debates last about 40 minutes each. They're on a... It's relevant to committees, please. Well, it's about making the time I available. Will just, in your remarks, you know, if you yeah. can link it together. Yeah, well, what it does is it, it allows you to have those debates on the uh, afternoon on the Tuesday, and because there are no decisions, therefore committees could meet at the same time on a Tuesday afternoon. So you're actually allowing both things to happen at the same time. And members' debates, by definition, are promulgated by members. Therefore, if members don't want to be involved in that Tuesday afternoon, they wouldn't submit members' debates. So it gives a lot more flexibility. You could also redefine, you could also redefine the topicals to a more, a more sort of topical general. You could broaden out the, the definition to allow more questions on a Tuesday, including real topical questions. You could extend yeah. FMQs and move yeah. them, and that's giving you're, you the you're space being, you need. You're being naughty. When, right, OK. <laughs> Just saved it at the end. There. I've got Mary and then Cameron. Can I ask a, a, both of you a very specific question about committees? And that is around the way that committees plan what they do, plan their inquiries. And, and I'd be interested if you think that committees are focused enough at the start of an inquiry on what they want the outcome to be, and if the correct amount of planning goes into that. 
so that committees aren't having evidence session after evidence session and getting the same type of um, the same type of evidence back. If they're focused enough, or should more be done at the very start to make committees sharper and more focused? Well, I think that's an excellent question. I really do. Actually, we we tend we tend to have an away day in the summer before we come back to look at our work program in some detail. And what we have is we have certain dates that are effectively scheduled in where we where, where, you know we're going to get. Um, you know, for example, uh, uh, financial memoranda, or indeed the budget process, etc., and that gives us flexibility in, in our time. But, as a, but, but what we are committed to to doing in, in the finance committee is doing things efficiently, which is why, if we get a mountain of evidence, we tend to take it from the people who have very divergent views. And if we're taking panels, we often have people with divergent views on the same panel so we can get a wee bit of interaction and debate and discussion. But the important thing is to focus on exactly what we want the outcome of any given inquiry to be. I think that's absolutely right. And the last thing we want to do is to be droning on through week after week. We don't have the time for that anyway, but if we did have the time on something which we don't believe will ultimately make uh, much uh, difference. It's, same, you know, it's always a balance between engaging stakeholders and ensuring that you don't uh, overdo it. And we do roundtable discussions uh, sometimes, and as well as straightforward witness statements um, uh, in going out. But yeah, I think that's very important that uh, you cannot, as a committee, work on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, even with the best clerks, and the clerks of finance are excellent, um, you have to have a long-term structure and you have to know what time you'll have available because it may be that two months down the line, as happened last winter with the, with the abolition of the community charge bill, that the government will just throw a wee hand grenade in and try and uh, come up with something out of the blue. And we just told them, look, I'm sorry, uh, there has to be time for uh, public engagement and consultation on this. And so a bill that was going to come forward before Christmas was put back into the new year. Uh, so, so, um, so we have to have that a uh, flexibility. But you, you're right. There's no, we, we won't have work for the sake of it. Sometimes the finance committee will do a three or four hour shift. Sometimes we'll only do ninety minutes. We're not going to do work for the sake of doing it. So, do you, um, do you think a lot of that comes down to the strength of the convener? Well, I think the convener obviously has a major role simply because, for example, when it looks at financial mem mem memorandum, I will sit, I will look at all the evidence that's been submitted after a call the evidence has closed and then uh, d decide uh, whether or not we should A, take oral evidence uh, or, or not, or just send it for uh, our, the evidence we've received en masse to the lead committee. Uh, I then will take that to the committee itself to ask whether they agree with that um, and they also will get copies of the submissions. So if they say, well, no, I think we should take evidence. Uh, so far in the last four and a half years, the committee members have never disagreed with me on that. So when, we've, when I've suggested we take evidence, they've always agreed and when I've suggested we don't, uh, they, they've not. And the part of that is because of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of um, support you get from the clerks and, and, and the kind of suggestion they make. So of course the convener has a major role to play in all that. Your question, Mary, I think uh, one of the perverse things of having uh, a very, very tight timetable is that we've become quite fleet of foot in, in the Europe Committee. We run, a, we have a rapporteur system because a lot of European issues feed into other committees as well. So we, we, we use some of that uh, work. We use um, the, the ability to call for written evidence, putting those calls out as early as we possibly can, but we're very, very tight criteria as to what the questions would be. And we do some pre-planning, but... You know, things just come in and, and you need to deal with them. Um, so one of the challenges for a, a Thursday morning is is getting witnesses around the table for an 8.45 or an 8.55 or a 9 a.m. start. You know, sometimes that's difficult to get actual witnesses here in Edinburgh and around the table, especially, you know, in some of the topics I'm dealing with. I'm usually having to, you know, sign off expenses to fly somebody in for you know, somewhere in Europe or whatever, you know, to come and do that bit of work. Or we use a lot of video conferencing now. Um, so we, we do that. So we're a bit more fleet of foot in then how we, how we use that um, and how it works. So uh, that, that can be, uh, you know, it can condition you to, to, to be a bit careful with it. But we had started an inquiry about Connecting Scotland, which is a whole, whole aspect of it. And I had to sit down with the clerks the other day and basically, you know, kick it on at the long grass because we now have, you know, a, an announcement on the, the repeal of the Human Rights Act, which 
my committee in relation to the ECHR. We'll do that because the Justice Committee had absolutely no space to do it, you know, and we should be, we need to scrutinise, you know, any repeal in any British Bill of Rights and the impact it has on just the function of this place and the Scotland Act that set it up. And the other thing is an EU referendum. So we, you know, we, we can't, my, you know, that my committee could not react to those things and do that scrutiny. So it meant other work that we were doing had to be, you know, pushed aside and, and, and quite important pieces of work, you know, like on TTIP, on European structural funds and some of the challenges that were happening, you know, around about that. So a lot of the work that we do and some of this stuff is 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 actual direct letters to, to ministers or, you know, to organisations and, and get feedback to specific questions and then use that to formulate a report. So, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of getting enough people around the table and a, and a decent enough frequency to, to create your report just isn't there for us. We've had to use other ways to do that. Uh, just a wee second, just to say to colleagues, that's 50 minutes in so far. Um, I'm minded to let this run for another 25 minutes, which would take us to quarter two. Uh, but if anyone you know, has other obligations that require, and I'm getting a faint indication that might be the case. Yeah, um, you know, let, let's be flexible, but we do have to bring it to a conclusion at some point. Now, I do have Cameron, I've got George, uh, who's come in, and Ken wants to come in. Cameron, do you want to come in at this stage? Fine, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Convener. I, as I say, I've come into the Parliament late and from a business background, and I've found it very different to get used to certain things like these repetitive debates. But notwithstanding that, I think the committees are the most valuable part of Parliament. I actually find them very useful and very good, and that's where we really get into the meat of things rather than the debates, the form more formal debates. Um, also, I don't think the committee should meet at the same time as the Chamber. Absolutely not. I think it's absolutely disastrous because people would just choose and the choice might be made from them by the, com by the convener or by their party whips and that's not right. Um, I think also, my other question is which we haven't discussed is, I think the convener should, have a, should be paid extra to recognise their role. I really think that's the vital thing. And I think topical questions, I think it's very difficult to define what is topical. I've noticed some of the questions under topical questions are not really topical and I think that's a problem. So I haven't got a solution for that but that's my opinion on it. Thank you. Uh, let me bring George in for the first time. Sorry. Yeah. When we're talking about uh, scrutiny of uh, the subject matter that committees are dealing with, is it not the case in the limited time I've been here, I've noticed that there is almost a, a, a group of professional witnesses that do the rounds and take up an awful lot of time in committee and quite frankly on a few of occasions I could actually write a submission for them and know what they're going to say because it's, uh, it's always a bit of pantomime almost when we're at committee dealing with them. So is it not a case that we should maybe look at how we deal with that? I can understand the problem because when you try and do something different the clerks have a difficulty in trying to get people to come to the, the, the parliament to, to uh, give evidence but is there not a way we could actually make that better and get something a wee bit more from that as well? And just on the aside on the topical questions, I agree with Kenneth that the idea is uh, if I've got anything happening, I'm going to go for an FMQ. There is no way I'm going to use topical because I don't see it as a vehicle that's going to get my constituency matter out there. And I think we FMQs ain't perfect. Uh, if you're going to create a new democracy, why would you take the most aggressive part of the Westminster system and stick it into your new democracy? But it's a three-ring circus, but there must be a way we can actually find it to make it work by making it longer and giving us an opportunity to possibly have some of the ideas that topicals have had where you've got a chance to come back and forward and get a bit of a discussion going instead of this constant kind of almost well, the only difference between us and Westminster with FMQs is we don't have the two, lot, the two sword lengths uh, difference between us but it's almost the same kind of environment and uh, but that's one of the things I think topicals haven't been as successful I think maybe an amendment of FMQs giving us some more time to develop ideas that way as well but yeah my main issue with committees is the fact that we seem to have a group of professional witnesses that do the rounds and I don't know what benefit that gives us in committee yes I tend to uh you could ask. Uh, have a list of not the usual suspects and then if I run out of not the usual suspects then we go with the usual suspects um, but you know that was something I, I decided to do at, at the outset when I became the convener of the committee because I felt that it was the same people saying the same things around the table every other week you know and we wanted to hear from different and emerging and some new voices and maybe some you know some good discourse going on out there um, so I have a list I, I say to my clerks right find me the not the usual suspects and then we can work back from there. Mary's got a point on yeah, that. Cause well, one of the things that we, we, we discussed last week was what Parliament can pay advisors to come to give evidence. And I think that's one of the things that limits 
the, the people that come. I, I absolutely agree there is a, almost a list of suspects of people that come, but the big issue relating to that is what the Parliament pays. So, should we look to actually paying more to get the best people to come? Do and the give Welsh us Parliament pay about to give us a evidence? quarter, maybe a third more than we do for their advisors? Yes, on that last point, I think it's very important. I mean, we obviously, uh, you know, to be advise, uh, advisor to the Finance Committee is considered in some places to be a prestigious appointment. But if other people, if the, if the people who would be interested in that have got other commitments, then the pittance that's paid uh, is not going to attract them. And we actually have an excellent, we've been really lucky. We've had some great advisors, actually, and, and uh, there's not one I could, uh, I, I, I don't have the highest regard for, but that doesn't necessarily mean we'll have that, we'll be in that position in the future got a fairly uh, narrow pool to look at. In terms of professional uh, witnesses, so to speak, I think that's a really important issue that George has raised. Uh, when I took over the Finance Committee, it was the same old, same old. And whenever we had budget scrutiny, uh, so to speak, uh, all we had was folk coming along saying, gee, is more money. And I'd say, so where should we take the money from? Oh, that's nothing to do with me. Uh, ask somebody else. So we're not interested in that kind of uh, situation. If people don't have any ideas as to how we can equalise the budget, uh, you know, with regard to their portfolio, then their particular uh, area of interest, then they don't come anymore. So we try and be a bit uh, wider in terms of the net we cast. And I have to say that um, we've not had any real difficulty in getting witnesses. In and the witnesses are chosen not on who submits the evidence, but on the quality of the evidence. I think what's very important, though, is uh, in a committee is that the members of the committee actually trust the convener. And certainly I've tried to develop trust among members by, for example, I don't truncate what people can say or how long I get to speak for. I try and be as robust uh, uh, as is necessary in terms of our own ministers. Uh, and, uh, you know, the clerk was commenting yesterday that, uh, you know, that the, when uh, senior civil servants now come to talk to financial memorandum, whereas it was junior members beforehand, because they now know that if they don't know their stuff, they'll get turned over by the committee because it's our duty to look at the public purse and um, ensure that money is spent wisely and to probe and ask questions. And uh, no clerks have said that uh, the scrutiny now is the most robust it's been uh, since 99. And I think it's very important that all committees take, um, and all parties take the role of committees seriously and the conveners take that particular role. We can't have patsy conveners of any uh, political colour who will basically, uh, you know, not ask the difficult questions because they think it may embarrass uh, a colleague. I think that's, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if I don't ask it, I would expect someone else to, to ask it. But we've got a duty to the Parliament and to the wider Scottish public. So I think it's, that's very, uh, very important. And also, um, one of the things I've said to my members is that if you've got any issues or concerns, you know, um, or you want to know more about the process, please feel free either to come to myself or speak to the clerks. You know, it's not, they're not my clerks, they're the clerks to the committee. So, for example, if someone was a bit unsure about how one aspect of the committee business worked, they're quite free to, to go and visit. They don't have to tell me they're doing it. They can just go along any time they like and have a private meeting with the clerks to talk about things. So I think, I think trust is, is very important in the running of a committee. Can I, that, that sort of leads us into an important thing that we're maybe not given as much time to as we might, and that is conveners in the round. And the, the issue has been raised by Cameron, and it's come up before, mm. as to whether uh, conveners should uh, have some remuneration associated with the role. Um, can I put it to colleagues um, that one of the things that's been said is that conveners should be an alternative career structure for people as they develop their, 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 their parliamentary careers, as distinct from ministerial role really being the only one. And of course, we've already established the principle of paying for some positions when we pay for presiding officer and deputy presiding officer. So it's not. I'm not simply asking colleagues about pay, but sh should we have ways in which the conveners have greater status and how would we do that and David's signalling a desperation to come and comment on that. Thank you very much convener. Well as someone who is standing down as an MSP next May I've got no personal axe to grind in relation to this and I've also been a convener uh, of a committee. Uh, I think the status of conveners 
does need to be increased. They've, they've got a good status at the moment. I think it should be an even higher uh, status. And the way to do that, I think, partially, is to um, have a, a, a payment, not a large payment, but recognition that there is a lot of extra work uh, in convening a committee. There's a lot of stuff that goes on outside the committee that you have to be involved in and you have responsibility for. But we also need to look at the related issue that was raised about how conveners are appointed and the election of conveners. So I think those two things together, we need to tease, tease that out because if we're going to have uh, government properly held to account, and I think that is really important, um, and I'm speaking that as a member of the governing party, but it applies to all governments, then you must have strong, independent-minded conveners, if at all possible. Uh, and it's something I think we should uh, focus quite a bit on in, in this inquiry. Well, I will mention the remuneration. Actually, I do think the conveners do more work and have obviously more responsibility and more stress than, uh, than other members of the parliament. Uh, so I, would, I, I do think, um, you know, you could say I've got a vested interest, but I might not be a convener after the next election if I'm re-elected. Uh, so I, I do think it, it's odd that in local government, it's, uh, for example, where conveners are, are given remuneration, but they're not within the Scottish Party. I know the issue was debated, I believe, some years ago uh, in the Parliament, but I think now people realise that they, they, they can have the additional work and responsibility and the fact that you're not able to spend as much time on other things, you know, such as, for example, your constituents, etc., and on debates, I think is an issue. But uh, uh, in, in terms of the uh, the, the issue of um, how, uh, how conveners will be appointed, I think that's a matter that uh, the conveners committee has wrestled with to no avail. To be honest, uh, I don't think there's going to, there's any consensus on that particular uh, issue. Uh, so I think that's one I think that uh, we'd have to we, we would have to continue to deliberate on and look to see whether we can get a, get a system that people could really agree with on that. I mean, I mean the government obviously and the political parties are, um, appoint spokespeople, they appoint their own their own conveners, etc. I don't really think there's anything particularly wrong with that that system, providing the convener realises that once he or she is in that position, their first responsibility is to the committee and secondly to the wider parliament, certainly not to the government. Uh, I suppose it's interesting that in formal terms, of course, only the convener or the committee can remove the convener from office. Mar uh, Mary. Thank you. Um, very briefly, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. I think conveners should be given an additional payment because conveners not only do they have um, more of a workload, they have a huge responsibility because I think we should never forget that one of the founding principles of this parliament was that the committees did the work. So conveners have a huge responsibility to drive forward the, the business of, of this parliament. So I think that there should be a payment attached to that and it would elevate the status. And when I was a convener and a member of the conveners group, one of the things that the conveners group discussed and it was done once was that Conveners, the conveners group should have the ability to call government to them to take evidence. And that, again, elevates their, their status. And I wonder if that's something that should be done more often, that the conveners group can call government ministers or the first minister to give evidence to them. Yes, uh, can I just uh, answer that point? Um, the first minister has, has agreed to come whenever the conveners committee ask her to. She's coming to give evidence later this year. In fact, uh, um, the Prime Minister actually uh, suggested in the last Parliament that he'd be willing to come uh, also uh, to give evidence to the Conveners Committee. And I've been trying to get agreement on that for about a year now, um, but when that would, when, when we could do that. And I have to say the Conservative uh, Convener is, is not opposed to that. He's happy with that as well. But one or two other conveners are not so keen. Uh, so, I, But I, I certainly think that the, we, we met with... Um, uh, First Minister Salmon two years ago for about an hour and I think it was uh, with uh, First Minister Sturgeon an hour and a half last year and I think we're looking to, to perhaps make it more often than annually. Uh, what uh, the First Minister has agreed to do is answer questions specifically on the programme for government as it affects our individual committees. Uh, but I'd see no reason why, and my understanding is the First Minister sees no reason why she can't answer questions on, on, on further issues, at further points. It's just really, it's really a matter for the Conveners Committee to, to ask her along, and she seems quite willing to do that. 
Should, should, should committees have a role in the appointment of ministers in that uh, before appointment they have confirmation hearings as other jurisdictions do, yeah. right? That's a pretty yeah. unanimous yeah. thumbs yeah. down. Yeah. Run. Parliament and government have to be separate. Yeah. Exactly. And that separation has to be jealously guarded yeah. in my view. But and, Parliament and does appoint the minister. Uh, 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 sorry, Parliament Appoint approve, approves people yeah. as being suitable for ministerial appointment. Yes, and, and, I think the and cabinet appointment. ministers have to go. Uh, yes, there have been votes against me. Oh, yeah. I speak have. personally yeah. <laughs> in 2007, yeah. but it was simply to allow the opposition parties to participate in the debate. It was yeah. the real reason rather than opposing any individual. But, I mean, to the same extent, I mean, cabinet secretaries have to go to the court session and be approved by... Yeah. Whoever, technically the Queen, I think. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that, you know, we Well, even want junior ministers, the Queen approves, well, the Queen but approves not via the court, court session. Go to the court yeah. session. Yeah. Um, but it used to be a regular occurrence that the First Minister went to the conveners group. Um, I think there was a, a regular, I think it was twice a year it used to happen, and I think that should happen. I am not sure that it should be extended to junior uh, or other ministers. Uh, cabinet secretaries or ministers, um, because I'm, I'm not sure what the purpose would be. Um, surely it's the committees that they should be accountable to. My, my view is it's the committees that ministers are accountable to, absolutely. And uh, I don't really think the Conveners Committee uh, wants to or should actually uh, take evidence from anyone other than the First Minister herself. Okay, we're on the last ten minutes now. George, did you catch my? No, you didn't, right? Okay, well, that's fair enough. It's not compulsory. <laughs> I, I, I just thought I saw. Uh, right, let me just have a look. Is there anything in particular in our little list we haven't touched on at all? Yes, I suppose the, the, the thing we haven't made direct reference to, though there's been indirect reference to, um, do our two colleagues who've come to, to, to join us today have a view about to our ability or any reforms that might be necessary when this parliament gets extra powers. And I'm leaving aside the issue of the number of MSPs. Christina? Um, I think, obviously, you know, Kenny's already mentioned about some of the additional work that, that, that he'll have uh, in respect to that. And I think other committee con conveners would be, will be feeling the same. Um, I do think that there is a bit of room for doing some joint work with some of the Westminster committees based on, you know, the transfer of some of those powers, that sort of a transition period. There should maybe be a bit of work there that, that could could be done. Um, you know, when it comes down to if we need more committees and we're back to square one, where do we find the time for it? Um, I think that's a, a, a debate that needs to be o ongoing. Mm -hmm. I mean... A, the, a good way to ensure that there are more people available to serve in committees would be to have fewer ministers of increase from 16 to 23, but I can't see how that's going to change if the number of, if the amount of uh, responsibilities that the Parliament has is going to increase. I think it's a difficult one to answer, though, Convener, because we need to see where the dust is actually going to finally settle on the package that comes to us, and we need to see what we could feed into uh, to our existing uh, committee system. I do think, however, there may have to be a change in the committee remits uh, to, to be able to address some of these issues because I think what's going to happen is that the balance might change quite considerably on some committees relative to the workload of others. I mean, I can't see that, for example, Justice, which is quite a, quite a busy committee, but I can't see that it will be, be affected that much. Finance would be affected that much. But I have to say what's important as well in committees is that you have a, a, a small team that works well together. We've got seven in our committee. I certainly wouldn't like to see the number of members on the committees increase. Uh, we do have to have a party balance, so there's always a balance to be struck. But I know one time the presiding officer was suggesting super committees. Uh, and, you know, I can imagine they would meet all day and everybody would feel they would have to put their oar in and uh, I'm not convinced that would be efficient. In the first parliament we had 11 and 13 member committees and I don't think it worked as well as the, as the smaller ones where members uh, develop a level of expertise. Yeah, just to follow up on that point, Convener, I just wonder uh, if uh, the panellists uh, have a kind of general view on the number of members on committees because if you have seven on a committee, that's nice and tight and it gives you more or less the balance, uh, you know, politically, according to De Hont and so on. Uh, but some we can go up to actually, I think, 15 members on committees. Would it be helpful if those committees that have nine, ten, eleven members actually come down to seven? That would then free up the time of uh, MSPs who are on those committees to maybe, you know, do other things. Uh, would, would that be helpful if we 
squeezed it down to the lower I end? Have, I would have thought yes, but it's hard for me to comment on an, how another committee actually works. I know that some committees, I mean, uh, when I was in education for four years, it had seven members, and I understand it's got more than that now. I'm not really sure why, but I, I, but I think that I, I can only speak from my own point of view that seven, I think, is, a, is an ideal number. Um, there is there is one small issue. It's worth perhaps just testing what, uh, and today's meeting illustrates that uh, Gil Patterson is not with us, because he has he he's the convener of the SNP group, and he's undertaking some activities that are in relation to that role, and that's not a permitted activity. They would allow his substitute to come here and fill that gap, um, but it's a perfectly proper thing that he's doing. Um, is there a case for looking again at the rules for substitution? It's not a big deal, but I just... I think tied to one individual is, is difficult. Um, you know, because it's a named person, whereas I to maybe think just the party should be, you know, your substitution should be just come from your party ranks. Um, I could see I, I, disagreement. I know, I've, 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 it used to be like that, convener, and it, it didn't work very well because you had random people showing yeah, up. But at least this way, you know who it's going to be, and there's uh -huh. maybe a bit of consistency, yeah. and it helps the clerks hugely in the terms yeah. of progress. I mean, how, how, can you, how can they possibly? I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm substituting welfare form, and I've been six or seven times over the last couple of years, and. You know, it means that you have a responsibility to keep an eye on what's happening specifically in that, that committee. I mean, if I was just uh, are you free next week, Ugh, no. <laughs> you know, I'm, you know. I mean, why would you, I don't think there'd be any great enthusiasm, willingness to participate. I don't think it would add anything to the deliberations yeah. of the committee. So I think, you know, really, you know, one would hope that uh, the name named substitute could attend on most occasions. And there are cases when I'm not being able to attend because I've already got long-standing committee, uh, uh, sorry, constituency enga engagements or whatever, and I've been told we only a few days' notice. I mean, last week I was told, last Thursday, I asked if I could substitute, and luckily I was okay to do so. But, but you d I think a, a named substitute is, is definitely infinitely better than, than just uh, some uh, the, random individual. The, the, the circumstances under which substitution may take place, is that, should we just leave that as it is? It is, I mean, I think it's a perfectly... I'm, I'm all, I'm, it's just on my list of things to pause. I'm not proposing anything. I think the problem, sorry, I think the problem with substitutes is sometimes they don't have a knowledge of what's gone on before. They've got a lot of papers to read and everything before that to catch up, and that's the problem. So they, when they come, I have to see, ironically, though, I remember in the, the 2007-11 Parliament there was a, a political party that's not represented here today, and uh, they had someone on the committee that, that, that I think struggled a wee bit. And whenever there was something really difficult and complex, the substitute miraculously appeared. Uh, and was much more able to actually <laughs> deal with issues than the person who was meant to be serving on the committee. So, but I think it's really it should really be up to the, the parties to decide who their substitute is and what circumstances they fill in for them. Right. Let me just just finally see if there's any remaining issues that Cameron is signalling. Sorry, just the, the the issue I wanted to raise is stage three. Having I mean, as I said, just come into the parliament, I find the stage three there isn't enough time. I don't find it very. I know we discussed this before that we have the debate after the. Um, after the voting, and I mean, people just feel like snorf a dyke for, during the debate, and I don't find that very, I know it's been debated, I don't find it very relevant and I can't follow it. And that's my, a real issue for me as a person who's just come into the parliament. Do you know, I keep agreeing with you, Cameron, it's been a lot of sense to the end. I have to say that I think the stage three debate is utterly pointless. I think all the, you know, it's almost like all the excitement and the vim with regard to a particular bill, which has been building up, especially for the members who've got a direct role in it, it's building up and building up, and then suddenly, after all, it might have been there for hours, you've got this anti-climax debate of a debate, which you're absolutely right, nobody uh, other than the members and the minister who've got a direct input in the bill really take a, a great interest in it. To me, it seems bizarre. I think after the, the all the amendments, etc., you probably want uh, you know, a, a summon up to be able to thank the clerks and all those committee members who participated and stakeholders in, in producing the bill. But to have a debate on it after, effectively, it's been agreed to me, I've never understood the logic of that, and I would certainly remove that. To follow up on that, I have a lot of sympathy for that. And, and what you do find sometimes during the stage three itself, and this has happened to me um, in relation to an amendment, I've been told you've got one minute 
to propose your amendment because we're short of time. Uh, and yet the debate time after takes up an hour or so. If that hour was used as part of the exactly. stage three, yeah. I wouldn't have been restricted to one minute to make a, a case for an amendment. I would have got a reasonable time for it. Sorry, and people not on the committee have been directly involved with a great opportunity to come in yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and add their comments. Mm. But that stage three debate convener used to only be half an hour, and we seem to have gradually drifted. People complained um, that it was too short. Yeah. Hey, just can I say on stage three, of course, when it's the stage three amendment session, we are actually sitting as a committee. So Which that's properly within a remit, but the, the, the debate's another matter. Although, actually, the rules do not require us to have a debate. No, they don't. They no, do require us to make a stage three decision, decision. Mm -hmm. but they don't require us to have a debate. Mm. Right, uh, I'm, I've, we're, I'm 10 seconds away from my deadline. Christina has clearly got something else she wants to do. Uh, can I thank Christina and uh, Kenny for coming and uh, stimulating us to, to think about some other things. Um, that's been very, very helpful indeed. Um, feel free if you have afterthoughts that you think would be of value to us to, to either approach me personally, come and see the clerks, or write or email, uh, we'd be very happy to hear from you because we've all got a stake in getting this right. Thank you very much indeed. Right, colleagues, uh, agenda item six, um, and for the purposes of this, David, you are now the other side of the desk, um, is to take evidence from Dave Thompson on a proposed cost party group on consumer uh, affairs. Uh, David, do you want to make some opening remarks to uh, uh, the committee? Uh, yes, convener, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I welcome this opportunity to put the case for the establishment of a cross party group on consumer affairs, and in doing so, I'm very conscious of uh, discussions in this committee in the past and, and um, more generally about the number of cross-party groups. Uh, so that is something that was very much at the front of my mind when uh, uh, discussions started about the possibility of this particular group. The reason for um, establishing the group um, fairly late in the parliamentary session is that there are a number of changes uh, in the pipeline in relation to consumer protection, trading standards, and so on. Um, a number of new powers over advice and advocacy and so on are being uh, transferred if, if the process in Westminster concludes in the way I think it might, been transferred to this parliament. So there's going to be a greater remit in relation to these matters. The parliament is already responsible for the the structure of uh, enforcement, for instance, uh, which is currently done by local authorities. So COSLA have uh, a big input into this, as do the, the Scottish Government. And there are two reports uh, due to uh, come out in a couple of months' time uh, in relation to consumer affairs. It's also a very important subject that... Um, you know, impacts very much on uh, individuals across the country, um, not just in relation to consumer rights, but in, in relation to consumer credit and, you know, deprivation and various other issues uh, like that. So it was felt, and Citizens Advice Scotland, who are, you will see are uh, going to do the Secretariat's job for us, were keen to develop a forum that would deal with a wide range of consumer uh, affairs issues, uh, and I thought it was the right time to, to do that. Um, I should just make clear that I do have an interest in this, which is registered. I'm a vice uh, president of the Chartered Trading Standards uh, Institute in the UK, and I spent uh, my um, working career as a trading standards officer. Um, for 34 years. Um, so it is something I've got a particular interest in. You'll see from the list of organisations there that there's very wide interest in the, the, the cross-party group, and I would ask members to uh, agree to its establishment. Uh, thank you, David. 
I, I note, of course, that Cameron Buchanan is also the proposed deputy convener uh, of this. That does not inhibit his participating in the questioning of the proposed convener, uh, but it's probably something we should note. Now, colleagues, have we any issues we wish to raise? Patricia, George, Mary? Mary? Can I just um, ask you, Dave, d did you consider any other way to, to raise the profile of the issues other than establishing a cross-party group? Yeah, I, I've sponsored a number of events in the Parliament um, with the uh, Chartered Trading Standards Institute and, and Citizens Advice Scotland do that and various other organisations, but it doesn't really give you the opportunity to focus in in the way you can do in a cross-party group, which will meet about four times a year, but you can follow things through in a way that individual events, you can't really do that. And to set up something which is ad hoc, out with the rules of the Parliament, I didn't think was right. I think these things should come within the control of Parliament. Uh, so that's why... But given how late we are in the parliamentary um, mm. time, how many, how p potentially how many meetings would you propose to have before mm -hmm. session ends? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a meeting arranged in a couple of weeks' time, another one before Christmas, and there will be another one early next year. Um, it's also, I think, advantageous to have a group establishment established, and I know we're going to be considering uh, re-registration of groups, you know, and how that is done. It, I think it would be advantageous to have the group established. And I think Citizens Advice Scotland maybe saw me as a good vehicle to help promote this, given my own background. So that's why I agreed that uh, they asked to see me and made the case to me, and I agreed that I, I thought it, was, it should happen, even at this late stage. Okay. Right, I see no other. Patricia. Oh, Patricia, I beg your pardon. Um, I just wondered whether, given that we don't actually have the powers that you're talking about at the moment, whether it wouldn't have been better to wait till the next session um, to you know, be, be able to focus more clearly on what additional powers we, we might have rather than the ones we expect we might have or, sus you know, or have suspicions we might get, um, whether it wouldn't have been, you know, just in terms of timescale, more logical to do it that way around. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's, a, that's a fair point, but um, there have been quite a lot of changes in recent times, and there's a lot of concern over the lack of ability of trading standards departments and councils to be able to do their jobs. It's a very small profession, just, just a few hundred people, and they're spread out amongst 32 local authorities at the moment. Some local authorities have one officer. And if you look at the range of legislation that they deal with, for instance, it's pretty massive. Now, we already have the power to look at how the enforcement is, is structured and so on, but, but the... The UK government changed the whole system about a year ago, a um, year and a half ago maybe. The Scottish Consumer G Council, which was an excellent body that had built up expertise for 30 years, was abolished. Uh, I think that was a really detrimental step. Uh, and the, all these changes are coming in. And I think to have a forum like this, you know, will be very, very helpful. And I think it would be best to do it now rather than leave it till this time next year, for instance. Speaking as a proposed yeah. vice convener, I think it would enable us to flesh out certain issues and discard irrelevant ones, and that's why I think it would be a good idea to have two or three meetings now, so that when the next session starts, people realise we can focus on the actual issues that are vital. Would you want to come yes, My I Mary. just wanted to come back in. Um, when you said that the changes were made 18 months ago and, and there's been a number of changes in... in in, in the recent history. Why now? Is it because we're about to almost end a session and you want to establish this before the next session starts? And if there have been changes over the last 18 months, why have you waited to now to propose setting this up? Well, one of the reasons that I didn't uh, <coughs> decide to promulgate this off my own bat was I was very conscious of the number of cross-party groups. But when Citizens Advice Scotland approached me earlier this year with a request and sat down with me and made the case, um, I, I listened and I thought, yeah, it, it, it probably does need to be done. Uh, it's an area that uh, has 
a huge impact on individuals and businesses across uh, Scotland. So it's, a, it's very important. There's a wide range of consumer issues that, are, that need to be discussed and dealt with. Uh, a cross-party group will only be able to focus in on certain aspects, and I think Cameron's right. They need to, the group needs to focus in on the really important uh, aspects. And we've got uh, seven, six, seven months before the, carl uh, the Parliament goes, uh, you know, uh, finishes, dissolves, and, and I think that time could usefully be spent in developing the group um, so that it's ready to move on in the next Parliament if it's re-established. Right, colleagues, I suspect we've enough uh, from the evidence session to allow us on the next agenda to, to make the decision. Yes? Right. Okay. Um, let me thank you, David, for uh, providing evidence. Um, and let us, uh, uh, let us move on to agenda item seven, uh, which is whether to consider to accord recognition to the cross-party group Consumer Affairs. Um, does anyone wish to make any further observations before I simply put the question to colleagues? No? Well, in that case, the question is, are members agreed to accord the CPG and Consumer Affairs recognition? Well, you've got to say yes or no, Mary. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you want to defer the decision, that would be for further consideration. But if we do that, you know, defer it rather than take a decision today, um, we'd need to be clear what it is we want to happen before we make a yeah. decision. Yeah. Mary. Because yeah. I suppose my concern is the actual specifics of what the cross-party group will, will look at, and I do have concerns at this late stage that, that it will actually be able to do anything, and I'm also concerned that at the start of the next session that it's not picked up again, so we'll have a cross-party group that only meets three times and then falls. Um, so I'm afraid I would be inclined to say, no, I don't approve. Right, the case is not made. Just one yeah. moment, please. Patricia, do you believe the case is made? And, I, and I, think it, I think the balance is that the case has to be made, and if we're not satisfied the case yeah. is made, then you know, we should not approve. Patricia, do you have a view? I'm thinking. Sorry. All oh, right, in that case, George. Obviously, I've got a similar uh, opinion to Mary's, but the, where I differ is I think uh, Dave actually explained the reason why he wants to do it just now is because so that it's set up and available and someone else can pick it up when uh, the new session moves in. So I, I think I can see why you did that, because I can see once you've got the process and the group's all we're used to coming together and working together, I can see why you want to do it. Because initially my attitude was the exact same as Mary's, but I think you've uh, you've kind of swayed me, Dave, by saying I can understand why you want to do it at this stage, because that was going to be my question. Why now? You know? I have a concern about the time um, frame that, that's now left, and I, I, I actually wonder whether when we're looking at cross-party groups more generally, that might be something that we could usefully feed into the process. And I, I understand the case that Dave has made about what he wants to do. I'm also very conscious that Dave's already mentioned that he's not going to be here next year. So, you know, whether or not someone else will pick it up and run with it is, is perhaps moot at this stage. Um, I, I don't like to say no to cross-party groups and I, I'm very conscious that that's the role of this committee is to make a considered decision. I have two reservations. One is the timing and one is that I'm not 100% convinced that the work of the the work as proposed of the cross-party group actually fits in with the powers and responsibilities this Parliament has closely enough for us to um, be happy that it should proceed. Um, but I do think there is a, a kernel of... Um, there's enough information there that makes me think it's actually quite an interesting concept and quite an interesting cross-party group to be proposing. But I, I, I just do think it's um, almost pointless to do it now, frankly. But on the other hand, that's not my judgment to make. And if, if, um, if um, Dave and his colleagues wish to do it, then should I stand in their way? Probably not. 
No. Right. Well, let me let, let me just tell you. Well, no, I think, I think it's useful to have these points on the record. And we have previously, without coming to a conclusion, discussed whether in the last year of a session we should establish any. And this yeah. clearly fits into that timescale. Yeah. But we've not come to a conclusion on that, so it, it wouldn't be appropriate to apply that issue to us. Uh, and I think very narrowly the balance of the committee um, from the chair is that we will uh, court. Now, is anyone disagreeing that that's, that's the view the committee has come to? No. Right. We're agree In that case, we're agreed. Uh, but the record will show that we do so with the s not insubstantial reluctance. Um, the reluctance is due to the timing rather than anything else, is it? Rather than the um, efficacy well, of the... Well, of the well to, be, to, to be fair, Patricia articulated a virus issue, which was perfectly proper. There is no restriction in the parliamentary rules to our having cross-party groups and matters that the parliament cannot legislate on eh, or have administrative powers on. Um, but nonetheless, in our decision-making process, it's perfectly proper to, yeah. to, to consider that matter. I think we've put it on the record. May I suggest that members no longer make any other comments because we are minded to approve and any comments you might make might dissuade us. <laughs> So, on that basis, we are agreed to accord the CPG and Consumer Affairs uh, recognition. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Right, now that ends the public part of the meeting, so we now move into private session.